company. And um, 35 of my closest friends, including my brother, were in the same company. I get emotional. And um, they were in a company that went to Vietnam in the 4th Division. And before I got into service, five of my closest friends were buried. One being Tom Peterkin. I get emotional, but my, my brother was the company medic, and uh, Tom was our best friend growing up. So I was pissed off before I even got in. And uh, so uh, went to college, uh, 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 got into an alter altercation during the anti-war uh, thing. I was going to be just uh, thrown out of school, but in the meantime, I got ill had to have an operation, so I got out of school and enlisted in the warrant officer flight program and uh, failed my second class one flight physical. They put me in the infantry. infantry. I was on my way to Vietnam as, a, as, a, as an E3, and uh, I got accepted to officer o OCS in Fort Belvoir. So I uh, went to Vietnam uh, on uh, the 31st of uh, September or the 30th. Landed in Da Nang, and uh, you know I knew a little bit. I was 21 years old and uh, didn't know where I was going to go or what I was doing, and uh, was uh, sent to the 45th Engineer Group, and I was assigned to the uh, 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 command of the uh, first platoon of the uh, 511th uh, Engineer Company, and. Uh, the 511th was what was called a bastard company. We were not tied to any battalion, division, or anything. We were just a standalone company. We had extra personnel because we didn't have a, a uh, uh, an S1 or an S3 operations or personnel. We were just, and uh, as you can see by the handout, I was shuffled to many different units. Uh, and, um, in the uh, in in the process, I get to, I got to meet a lot of people. Mike, would you hand me that book here? This one. Yeah, I'm kind of limited on time. I'm going to show you a picture in this book. One of the best pictures of of Vietnam and of all the hundreds of uh, fire bases. There's only one in this book, and this is uh, Hill 88 which was uh, uh, later named uh, Firebase Tomahawk. And I could talk forever about this. At the end of the talk, if anybody wants to learn the history, it's a great history of the Vietnam War. Uh, that's a uh, mechanized 155 uh, National Guard uh, battery that was on that hill. And um, my unit was one of a couple of engineer units that built that firebase. So I will uh, have this available later because I can't uh, get on a tangent with it. Okay. My first assignment, uh, Da Nang was uh, right somewhere here. Uh, Up here. Yeah. No. Chulai, Da Nang, right yeah. here. This is where I landed. And just north of Da Nang, was High Van Pass, and that was my first assignment. High Van Pass was this mountain that came out of the ocean, and it was literally, by the, as the crow flies on QL1, not even... What's the other chart? Oh, okay. Yeah, here's Da Nang, here's High Van Pass. Um, as the crow flies, it was only 1.7 miles. And Army engineers built a highway that zigzagged uh, like this, and it was over 17 kilometers the length to travel 1.7 miles. And I was not, it started before I got there. Uh, we got involved widening it, building bridges, uh, rebuilding bridges, uh, bunkers, et cetera, et cetera. The one thing that made High Van Pass unique was every time there was a turn and a uh, 
switchback, and there were two big ones that were called the rabbit ears. If you were flying over a chopper, it looked like a, a, a big bunny rabbit because of the big ears. Every time there was a switchback or a U-turn, there was a six-man uh, uh, Marine unit. Now these guys, these guys were the ultimate warriors. They built their own underground bunker right at the end of the uh, at the end of the uh, uh, road, and uh, these guys slept all day. I, I, I saw guys uh, on top of their bunker taking getting suntans in the afternoon. They slept all day. Right as it was getting dark, they would booby trap their unit, their uh, their uh, bunker, and the six of them would go out into the jungle and either go on a patrol to engage the enemy, or they had a mission to uh, uh, protect a bridge from being blown up, which they did all the time, and culverts and things of that nature. So these Marines were always out at night and had nothing to do but either eat or sleep or uh, whatever they did, you know. I have, a, I have some video that uh, I, I bought a Super 8 camera uh, because it looked like a nice camera. And my radio operator happened to be a professional photographer, so uh, when we weren't in a dangerous place or something, he would take some film for me. And I'll show you uh, some of these uh, uh, things. Uh, when I got up there the first time, I was scared to death. It was the most frightening place I'd ever seen in my life. But at the same time, probably the most beautiful. The South China Sea was right at the base of it. It was absolutely gorgeous, and you'll see it in the video. Um, and uh, sometimes the clouds would come up, you know, three quarters way down, and we would just drive into fog. And at the top, the ter terrain was like 70, 70 degrees straight up, and if you went off the road, it was 900 feet to the bottom of, of all the rocks we pushed down there. And an incredible number of vehicles that hit mines or had blowouts and flew off the, uh, uh, the edge of that thing. It was, it was, it was sad. Uh, uh, civilians military vehicles, uh, transportation vehicles, uh, combat vehicles, just n enormous amounts. Um, my job uh, as a platoon leader, I usually had either one big project or four or five where I had squads uh, working on uh, road problems, uh, build re uh, bridge repair, uh, bunker, building bunkers for the Marines, and things of that nature. And um, after a while, you just get oblivious to the, uh, uh, to the danger of the road. If, as you know, as you go up I-70, there's rock slides that come on I-70. Anything could have happened. And when, before I got on there, I thought to myself, uh, you know, th we're pretty vulnerable. The enemy had all the uh, opportunity. They could do whatever they want to us. But I think what happened was uh, that group of uh, Viet Cong and NVA regulars did not have a lot of ammunition, so they could only pick and choose whether they ambushed a convoy or an engineer unit or uh, an infantry unit that they, they chose to uh, engage. Uh, they did a lot of harassing. One of the problems that we had in Ham High Van, if we, when we did get hit, we could not call for any artillery. Because if we called for artillery and we had a switchback and you had a squad under fire uh, and you had 105s coming in uh, 200 feet over the hill, there might be another squad working on another project. And with the, the, the uh, six guns coming around, we could not use uh, any artillery. So um, I, I, I got uh, probably about 40 uh, M40s, which are grenade launchers that you could use like a mortar, and it, it was like little baby artillery uh, that we, we could use. And um, so that was my first, uh, uh, my first month I was totally on high van pass. At the, at the end of my first month, uh, I was um, 
I was uh, opcon operational control of the second of the 327th Infantry, commanded like uh, by uh, uh, Charlie Beckwith, called Charger, uh, one of the one of the great officers uh, of the Vietnam War. Uh, he later commanded the mission to rescue the Iran hostages in 1980 that w was a fiasco and uh, Jimmy Carter got on the TV and said that it was scrubbed by the commander on the ground which was not true. Charlie Beckwith never ran away from a battle and uh, I'll, I'll, I want to show you. Um, well I'll tell you, before, before at, after the first month I was with the 35th engineers at the base on the north, uh, on the south side of High Van. My platoon then went to Hill 24, which was on the north side of High Van, to be closer to QL1 to Fubai, which was 40 miles. And uh, uh, Charlie Beckwith was responsible for that area of operation, and he needed more engineer support. So basically, I took my orders from, from uh, the CO of the 327th Infantry and did what he wanted to do. If I had free time during the day, then the 35th engineers integrated me with uh, the other engineer units working on High Van Pass. And um, I think it was sometime in early October. This is this is a piece of shrapnel that I brought home with me. This was from a 180, 122 millimeter rocket. And I'll show you in my video. Hill 24, trying to figure out why, early on, why is it called Hill 24? Well, our, our back boundary was the South China Sea. So we're sea level, and I think it elevated to 24 feet. And the, the, the map guys called it Hill 24. That's all it was called. We had two infantry companies, an artillery company, some um, military police, and another engineer company, which I don't know who it was. I, I can't remember some of them. And uh, one night we had, right after dark, we had a, uh, 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 a probe into our perimeter while we were being rocketed and mortared. And I'll show you on the video that it was a brand new. We didn't have our, our bunkers built. We just had firing positions and it was raining because it was uh, probably monsoons and everything, and these 122s and regular mortars and things were coming in. And this thing came flying into a sandbag, a wet sandbag, and it was hot, and uh, the, the steam, and I can't remember who was next to me. He said, he said to me, he says, I'm sure glad I didn't get a little closer to you. <laughs> so I, I, brought, I brought this, but, but the interesting thing, the record, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the word on Charlie Beckwith, and that's why they called him Charger, he was always in his, his plane. And if one of his units got attacked, he would be on his stomach with boxes of grenades just dropping them right on the enemy. The guy had in his military <coughs> career 30, 35 Purple Hearts. Uh, he got a gut shot in 66, uh, and most of you know, you get a gut shot from a high, high velocity uh, AK-47 or a 50 caliber, you, 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 he, he recovered in a short time and went right back, back in. And so these, uh, these rounds were coming in and we were coordinating our, uh, our, uh, our fire. And about the other COs that we were, uh, were talking on the radio, we didn't know where, where the artillery was originating so we couldn't call any support and everything. And I hear this on our, on our thing. He says, uh, this is Charger 6. He says, I'm flying above you guys. He says, uh, I'll direct all the artillery. He says, I can see where it's coming from. And he brought the wrath of hell on him. And it ended after about 10 minutes. So it's raining. It's, uh, the, the wind's howling. And he's up in the, in the sky uh, during a mortar rocket attack uh, coming to our uh, rescue. And that's why he was called Charger. He never, any time any of his units were under attack, he got in his aircraft if he wasn't in there, and he was on his way. Uh, what would he be in flying? Pardon? What would he be in, in what aircraft? In a uh, Huey, a Huey gunship, okay. yeah. 
How old were you? Pardon? Highman Pass part of QL1. Yes, Highman Pass. I drove your highways all the time. <laughs> yeah, you went over high again? Yeah. Scary place, isn't it? Yeah. I had two flat tires, three flat tires up there and put my spare on and had to borrow two more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah you, your One first comment just for go Google high band pass. And right now again it's the major QL one road in Vietnam, it's now all paid. Uh, but they highlight there are all sorts of traffic accidents still going on constantly. It's a very dangerous road even now. Yeah. So basically I just continued for uh, for the next four months under the 327th and the 35th engineers doing my thing with Hill 88 and mine sweeping. Uh, these kind of mines that were uh, that they had that were crude, we had to actually disarm them rather than blow them in place. And we would have two-man teams and I included all officers and NCOs in a, if it was your turn, it was your turn. You get on a stomach, it's 118 de degrees. Uh, 118 degrees uh, out and you're on your stomach and you're checking with the other guy and said, well, the red, red wire or the green wire? And you talk about the sweat. Uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was t a tough time. So Mike, if you want to Quick thing. How old were you then? 21. 21. Yeah. And responsible for a platoon uh, about 40. Uh, we were had we had bigger platoons okay. in uh, for like 50, 55, I think. Yeah. And uh, I, I will I mention some talking to Mike. Yeah. Officers when they went to Vietnam for a one year tour, they got six months of command and six months of staff. And for some reason, I got a whole year of command. I don't think they wanted me in an office, <laughs> or or they wanted to get rid of me. You know, it was a good way. I enjoy. I I liked having, being in a command position. It was more of my liking. I was, I was kind of a street hoodlum growing up. So, I liked I liked getting in the scraps. So, Mike's going to show uh, my high van par pass part, and I'll tell you when to stop if I if you can. I told him I'm not going to touch it. I get near a computer, it breaks down. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, we'll just do it up front. Maybe leave in the back. Why don't you flip the light switch? There? Now you're going to see. I did have my RTO when we were we were going pretty fast, and I said to him, I said, get a get a shot of of the drop off. And you'll see my my Jeep. I'm sitting in the in the passenger side, and it's 900 feet straight down. And you know you're hoping nobody's shooting at you. Okay. That that was a that was a uh, destroyer that we got some. Here, here's the beginning of High Van Pass. This was a stretch of going up. This wasn't too bad, but you can see the ocean was just incredibly beautiful. And it's all now this is, pardon? All dirt rock. Yeah. <laughs> this is the drop off. Now, when you see one of the, when you see an American flag stop, that'll be one of the marine. This is the switchbacks up to the top. Uh, the marine bases that I was mentioning. And if I had four different units, I was traversing this road all day long. I mean, incredibly beautiful place. I want to go back to Vietnam. The beaches there are incredible. I feel so fortunate that I got this footage. I think this is one of the bunkers coming up here that the Marines inhabited. That, oh, stop here. This is a. Uh, oh. Well, okay. it's, it's one of these things. That okay, I'll just talk real quick. Yeah. That was an old French fort. We couldn't get back to Hill 24 and we spent the night there. 
uh, scared the hell out of me. It was raining, and I had two tracked vehicles that uh, we uh, had, and I, there were probably uh, 40 or 50 of us with one squad of uh, infantry with us. Uh, this is on the on the back side. You'll see one of these uh, marine. That's bridge we built three times. They really enjoyed blowing them up, especially with us on them. Did you put in the pontoon bridges too? Uh, 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 no, well, just just one. Okay, there's a flag. That's that's one of the marine things. They had their own little house. There's six guys. Now this this is the this is the kind of drop off. <laughs> you know you don't want to blow out at 40 miles an hour, uh, coming off of here. And if 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 we took enemy fire, you wanted to get as close to the embankment because you, you had no place else to go. And uh, you hoped to God that there was no big Chicom Claymore against the walls, because that's what they did on the convoys. It could blow a, a vehicle right off the road. He was going too fast, and I probably told him to. <laughs> but after a while, you didn't, you know, you expected to just finally just go off the road anyway. So you didn't worry about it. I don't know why it stops now and then. Okay. Okay, this is Hill 24. We were just building it. And you can see the, the, the uh, little emplacements. We didn't have bunkers yet. And that was back to high vamp. This, this is not all. Uh, this, yeah, this, this is Hill 24 still. You can see the ocean. Hill 24 on high vamp. It was right at the base of it on the north side. And like I say, we, we, we were just building it at the time. Well, sorry. Stop. Now that, that ocean was our, let's see if I, that was the eastern boundary. And if you can stop it right here. Okay. Okay. These I'll, I'll these these choppers were there to pick us up. On the twenty third to the twenty sixth of October, Operation Rich, the fifth division, the Diamond Division, was in the DMZ, and. Uh, a uh, tank battle was going on, and I think it was in North Vietnam. And, uh, pardon? When? When is your birthday? November 5th. And so, um, what happened was the bridges behind them was blown up. And because we were originally a panel bridge company, we didn't have a panel bridge, but most of my NCOs were bridge NCOs. We were told to get all our uh, gear for a Bailey Bridge. They got, an, they got a Bailey Bridge from the Marines, from the Navy, and they airlifted that. And we had to go up there to, uh, to put a bridge so these tanks and APCs, because uh, of an armored cav squadron, in, engaged the enemy. And when we landed to put the belly bridge up, and I'm looking, and I see these burnout T-24 Russian tanks with a big red star, uh, scared the living hell out of me. I realized, you know, how close communism was. <laughs> and so that was a little, little, uh, little vacation. We got a little R&R. &R. And so you can just pa uh, sp uh, stop by right, right there. And we'll keep it going until I hit 80, Hill 88, unless it, did, it, did I already? Did you see me all in the mud no. anywhere yet? Okay, I'll just talk while. Then so we worked uh, we worked uh, on QL1 and High Van Pass until January 1st. January 1st, uh, there was a uh, uh, desire to resume combat actions in the Ashall Valley. 
which was right here. This is Route 547, and that's way. This is QL 140 kilometers that we worked in uh, doing mine sweeping, blowing up enemy bunkers, and things of that nature. Right under there was Firebase Bastogne, where uh, my company was, was headquartered. Uh, Firebase uh, Birmingham was right here. Blaze was here. There were over 70 fire bases in this area. Is there a Hawk Hill on there? Hamburg, Hamburg, I don't. It, Hawk Hill, I think it's Bill 29. Uh, I don't know. That doesn't show it. No, yeah. Uh, fire support things. Um, when you see, when you see uh, ha, uh, Hill 88, I'll keep talking. That was that was Christmas. We, <laughs> I'm gonna know. You see the black T-shirts. Vietnam, the guys that were anti-war, the pacifists with the peace signs, they wore black t-shirts. They were great soldiers, but they wanted everybody, the generals and everybody, to know that they were anti-war. They were draftees. They had no choice, but as a group, they all wore black t-shirts to signify uh, uh, who they were and what they represented, but they were all good soldiers. Never had a problem with a single one of them. Um, and so, get on a, on a tangent here. So, come January 1st, uh, we moved the entire company. And I think right around that time, I became the executive officer of, of the 511th. And a short time right after, I took command of the 511th for the remainder of, of, my, of my tour. Uh, in Vietnam, I was a first lieutenant or a captain. Most of the time, I was a first lieutenant. Um, so we, we got to F Route 547. I was, I was the primary engineer company in the middle of 547. It was closer to the Ashall than it was to Huey. Uh, the 27th engineers, who were the, was the main unit, was closer to Huey in uh, uh, Gay Lee uh, Combat Base, which was near Camp Evans, which was the headquarters of the 101st Airborne. This was a soccer game we, after we got drunk on Christmas. Uh, we're playing. The CO at the, at the time, Lieutenant Phillips, played on the uh, soccer team uh, at West Point. He was the first lieutenant also. And I might know, you might know, his name was Phillips, and the command sergeant major of the battalion was his father, which is a, a com complete rarity that two family members uh, could uh, be in the actual same unit. So we got to, uh, we got to, uh, uh, now, yeah, why don't, why don't you fast forward and then stop it. Um, what do I look for? Uh, look for uh, me in the mud at Hill 88. You'll, you'll see a road and a big hump in the ground. So just kidding, I'll, I'll just keep talking. So when we got to uh, uh, Bastogne, uh, they, they named a number of the, the 101st, uh, where you were mentioning, the ones I put, air, that I remembered, these are all fire bases. Air, uh, Airborne, Anzio, Aero, Bastogne, Birmingham, Blaze, Boise, Boxer, Brick, Canyon, um, Kalachis, Fury, Geronimo, uh, Ripcord, uh, Hill 1000, Pistol, and one that I can't read my own writing, which is per typical. Okay, that's stop right. That's the beginning. Stop right there. Okay. So my my area of responsibility for uh, 547 was. Uh, First and foremost, mine sweeping. Um, we did that early in the morning, usually when it's almost dark. We repaired bridges, culverts. We built bunkers. We built fire bases. Uh, we applied rock to uh, the road. Uh, fire, bla a fire base blaze, the 27th engineers had a rock crusher that when we expanded it to a functional uh, Oh, two-lane highway. 
two-lane highway, uh, we put rock on uh, the roads so it won't get muddy uh, while we were, uh, you know, doing our thing. Mike, were you under fire at any time do during uh, repairs? You know, I, I wanted to mention that. I, you know, I, I, have, I have a great uh, admiration for the Vietnamese people and as warriors, because they had been at war for so long, uh, never once were our unarmed engineers uh, took fire. You know, because they, they had to put their guns down. And you'll see some pictures here where they'll be on a, on a, on a bridge girder with their shirt off, you know, grabbing ropes. And to be an engineer, you had to put your weapon down. And uh, as soon as everybody was armed, <laughs> they didn't have any problems shooting at us. <laughs> but never once while we were on a, on a project where we had our unarmed men, uh, did they ever, ever uh, fire at us, you know? I, to me, I, I thought that was quite honorable. You know, they, you know, they they knew what it was like for their uh, people on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, uh, you know, being hit and everything. But never, never once did we have a work pro party where six, 60, 70 percent of my men were unarmed. Their, their rifles were in their vehicles. Some of them had had sidearms. We usually had infantry support. Uh, with us with the, from the 327th and along that note well, there's, pardon? What, there's fires, there's that fires that's stone. gives you an idea of the difficulty of the train <laughs> yeah if, if, if everybody's gone to Vale from from Golden to almost Vale is the length of 547 and just like going here uphill downhill uphill downhill triple canopy jungle and uh, sometimes the, 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 it was so steep, we we're trying to cut through these hills that we had to take tank retrievers to the top and winch some of our vehicles up so they wouldn't flip over backwards. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was an incredible experience. And I, I have some great film. Uh, the, only, uh, the only combat footage I have is we got in late one afternoon, uh, a little early. Usually we got in almost the dark. And uh, there was a, a hill, that other hill back here. I'm, I'm a little disoriented because that's on the back side. I was on the, on the west side towards the Ashaw Valley. We had a big hill that they always murdered us at. And so it was like... Uh, like half an hour before dark, and uh, so they started shelling us, and you can you can hear them, and you can see the uh, the rocket, the the little puffs of smoke on there. So we called in some artillery, and when I did, they said that they had uh, four Cobras uh, fully loaded, just waiting for somewhere. So after the artillery, uh, I have footage of these Cobras which a Cobra is a, uh, a sleek uh, uh, helicopter that uh, had immense fire player. And when you, when you see it, you can actually see the puffs of smoke uh, when they're shooting their rockets. And it, it looks like that they're slowing down a little bit, that the, that the force of the rockets makes it go backwards, but it, that, that's not the case. But these Cobras came in and just put every, all the ordnance they had on the side of the hill. Didn't stop them, you know. But I do actually have footage of that because they stopped shelling us when we uh, called in uh, some 105 uh, uh, support. Uh, uh, let me let me see where I am in my my notes, Mike. And sure. I don't know. I mean, are they as high as, they're not as high as the rock? No, no. no. It, it, it looked, they, 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 they probably, that's, pro that's probably like, uh, like the, Cas the Catskill Mountains in New York is, you know, they seem very, uh, uh, 
And they just rose out of there, you know. And, uh, yeah. and all triple canopy jump. You can have a whole division down there flying over. So, and I didn't mention back, back, I think it was like February or March, the 9th Division went home. But the 9th Division left one armored cab squadron, which was a C squadron, 3rd of the 5th Cavalry, commanded by a Captain Huff. And he was our direct support uh, when we would go out on missions. His tanks and his APCs were, was our protection. And so uh, uh, the 3rd of the 5th, the only 9th Division, and it was sometime late April, he came to me and said, I'm leaving in the morning. And I'm going to say like April 25th. And I said, where are you going? He says, going into the Ashaw Valley. And I said, what's going on? And he says, there's going to be a major assault uh, into the Ashaw Valley um, real soon. So I kind of knew something was going on. Increased security and let's see. Okay, right here, this is 547. And I can't remember, I can't remember exactly, but it was either on the 8th or 9th of, uh, of May. There was a bridge right here that was totally destroyed. And on the 9th, we went in there, and it was going to take three or four days to rebuild it, but they needed a lot. So we did a bypass. We, got a, we took a 30-inch culvert you know, for the water, and then we just knocked some trees down and, and pushed the dirt, and we did one lane around it so traffic could pass. On the morning of the 10th, uh, we went... Uh, Real early, we did our mine sweeping, and we were starting to prepare to rebuild the bridge. It was a, it was a uh, big, big uh, timbers, you know, 12 by 24s with going across. And that was right there on the morning of the 10th. And all of a sudden, we heard we just, you know, I mean, I'm going to say, 10,000 rounds of automatic weapon fire and 70, 100 aircraft, you know, smoke and stuff. And the bridge was right there, and Hamburger Hill was right there. And tenth, the 10th was the beginning of Hamburger Hill. So, um, I, I, you know, I found out when I got back to uh, Bastogne that evening my first sergeant told me what was going on. We had to go back there to work on the bridge, but they needed us and another engineer unit to actually go to Hamburger Hill and uh, build a landing zone for uh, extra infantry or and a, uh, what do you, help me Mike, uh, uh, for wounded, it's uh, an aid well, station. Okay. Yeah. So we had to pick a place that was sh uh, shielded by a lot of trees from enemy mortars, and we built a, a uh, so we were there on the 11th. That was the second day. And okay, so on the 11th, we came back. Twelfth, we went back to uh, uh, to rebuild that bridge. The battle really raged, and unknown to me that uh, because of the scope of Hamburger Hill, they needed closer artillery support. And my company, if uh, if, if if I'm just going to use this, if this was Bass Stone, my company was right here pointing to the west, and right next to me was a 155 mechanized uh, artillery battery. In fact, one of the guns was right next to my, my mess hall. And uh, so 
so un un unknowns to me that uh, they were ordered to move on the 13th uh, to, I think, Firebase Va Blaze or Vogel for direct support for the operation at Hamburger Hill. Um, yeah, you can s see right here. I think it's hard to this tell. is my mess hall. Th that's one of the 188 or the 155. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, and this was one of my platoon uh, areas. In our platoon areas, we had bunkers that the guy uh, guys could go into during rocket attacks and things of that nature. And so, un unknowns to me that they were moving the next morning on the 13th. And I got my dates a little uh, screwed up uh, that I know that we had a horrible uh, attack on uh, Mother's Day. Now, Mother's Day was the 12th in Vietnam. It was the 11th in the States. And I, you know, I know for, knew for sure we got hit on Mother's Day night. And you know, like, if, 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 you, if you're at New Year's Eve, you go out on New Year's Eve and it's 2 o'clock in the morning, you still think it's New Year's Eve, you know, even though the next day. And so, uh, and, and I don't know, I don't know why I had a block, I had a block of, of for the last 47 years, um, that I, I, I always knew that we had, uh, 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 we got hit on, uh, on uh, Mother's Day. And it was the 83rd uh, artillery battery C. And uh, I, 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 I could never understand why I was outside of my headquarters running to the first platoon uh, with rockets coming down, because it was not our protocol. The protocol was if we got a rocket attack, first thing we did was we called for illumination to see if we had a ground attack. And then everybody, including myself, because you don't want to be out there, you counted to 45. As soon as you went 45 without another blast, that meant that, that, uh, that maybe they were done with the mortars and the rockets, and then we reinforce our bunker lines by that time. So, but but they, were st they were still raining down on me, you know? And I remember hearing them coming in, and I hit the, hit the ground, and I got two pieces of shrapnel, one, one there in my arm and one right there. And uh, I, I did not get a Purple Heart for that because of her. My, my oldest daughter. My wife was, was going to deliver her, and she had some issues, pregnancy issues. And back then they sent telegrams, you know. We're sorry to tell you, but your, your husband, Lieutenant O'Gradnick, has been wounded in action. Well, that's not a little bloody little shrapnel wound. It could have been both legs, you know, I could, you know, anything. And so I told my first sergeant, I said, don't put me on a casualty report. And I never realized, didn't know why the hell I was out there. And then I did some research. That battery of artillery actually uh, was breaking down to move early in the morning. And they loaded their uh, uh, powder, powder kegs and their ammunition into boot, deuce and a halves. And it was exposed. And they took three direct hits. And there were two guns on fire and dozens of casualties. And now I remember the CO called me and said, Mike, he said, our guns are on fire. They hit our ammunition. Uh, can, you, can you move uh, a dozen or more men to cover three of our bunkers? Because we need to pull the remaining guns that weren't on fire to safety. So that's why I was outside. They, casual, they took, what, 20, 29 yeah. casualties just from that night. I think I had three men wounded that night. Um, so that was three really crummy days, you know. And then that bat battle raged on for seven more days. Uh, and I can tell you a little bit about that. Um, that the idea 
the idea was uh, to uh, send three units uh, looking at my notes here bear with me how am I doing time wise Mike um, about 10 more minutes okay um, then we'll just at least take a break yeah um, they had the 3rd of the 5th cavalry at point then they had to the left they had the uh, 9th marines and the right uh, a uh, South Vietnamese uh, Ranger Regiment was the point and then the first of the 501st of the 101st was on the left and I think the uh, uh, second of the 506 was on the right so three regiments or battalions or, or two, uh, there were like four battalions going forth and uh, the third of the 187th was commanded by Lieutenant Colonel uh, uh, where is I, I never remember his name uh, began with an H um, I wouldn't worry too much about that. yeah well what happened was he was Westmoreland's golden child and he made a big stink because he was not part of the assault he had to do a rear guard action and it was his battalion that ran into Hamburger Hill and uh, Honeycutt was his name Melvin Honeycutt uh, he thought he was going to miss the fight and the fight was all him and as a little side note uh, after that battle the morale of the 101st was so bad that there were units sitting down refusing to fight and they called off the offensive and uh, uh, everything just kind of calmed down from from that point on and uh, it was uh, interesting that in 1970 they finally decided to go back into the Ashaw value Valley for a uh, another offensive uh, 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 and they the main unit was on firebase ripcord and they didn't realize that there were 30 to 50,000 MVO MVA regulars surrounding them they had anti-aircraft guns into the mountains big you know like boom 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 type of thing they were shooting down the choppers as they came in and Mike lost eight of his classmates at West Point in that battle at Ripcord uh, because of the bad press of uh, Hamburger Hill the press was excluded and I, I won't say it was a cover-up but it was never really reported to uh, the news agencies while the battle raged. Could you give me that? This is a, a book uh, Mike has about the about that battle. It was uh, it was quite intense, but just wanted to throw it out here. So now we can look at the uh, film of 547. What we're doing here, this is the, this is the hill that they always hit us from. What we're doing here was when it got dark, we were going to go out and place extra claymores, and we were shooting up the area. If they had some booby traps, we wanted to shoot, blow those up before we went in. We had starlight scopes so we could see where we were going, but we were trying and, and like places like that we were they had defilades where they could hide and everything so we were just firing up the area you know we probably uh, and, and a thing like that we probably used more am ammunition than they did in the Battle of Gettysburg <laughs> yeah <laughs> that shows you why the infantry needed engineers because you could see the density of the yeah. jungle that <laughs> those are the guns that got hit. I'm sorry Mike yeah clear fields of fire just to give you some Distance. Later on, you 
<laughs> oh, that was before. I, I think they did the Agent Orange before that. But that's the that's the hill that they were, had all their tunnels in that they they like messing with us. And I don't know why there was two companies of infantry on the other side of Bastogne. I don't know what the hell they didn't put them there. You know, that's a, there was a military police unit based there to uh, uh, help with the highway. This is 547, and there would be convoys of 200 vehicles. And it's kind of funny, like the transportation units, uh, this was what was called a free fire zone. There was, no friend, there was no villagers, there was no population there. If you saw something move, you could just light it up. So uh, a 20-foot python, python going through, if you had a transportation unit that had their own uh, internal guys and guns and stuff, if they saw the bushes move, they would just light it up. <laughs> But these are some of the tough places where we had turns and hills that we had. Uh, that's you. That's me. Now what we're doing here is there'd be 52 craters right behind me, and it rained, so our men were taking uh, baths. We had there's, you can see there's a couple tanks of security, and uh, so everybody got their first bath in two months. You can see the dust. I was wiping the dust in my, on my arms. It was a pleasure to make a hole for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks, guys. Yeah. So you either were dusty or totally wet. Yeah. Now, I, I, after, after they were done, I, I went in. <laughs> but that, that's, that's how we got our... Uh, You can see the nose. And this is where we were applying some rock to, uh, to the highway. This was two, two full lanes. And our drivers were so good that we could lay a three inch le uh, of rock without even needing, needing a grater. Did you quarry the rock right from the same location? Uh, that was about 20 clicks uh, towards Hway, there was a rock crusher. Yeah. Okay. These are the cobras that we we called in on the hill, and you can watch the puffs of smoke. It'll come back to that. That's best known with with the rain. This was my com com change of command ceremony. This is when I took command of my company. They do a little thing like that. There were the equivalent of five to six full companies, combat units, on uh, Bastogne. And that was the CO of the 29th Engineers. The only time I ever saw him. 27th Engineers, I'm sorry. Yeah, the Army was into a lot of pomp and circumstance, even in the middle of the jungle. But it was it was a uh, 50, 50, 55 miles long, and there were my company was an intact engineer unit on Bastogne, and then the 59th Land Clearing Company at the end of 50 of uh, 547 was on a fire base there. The others all came from the coast every day to work, and there was probably five or six different companies. And then the 87th Engineers D Company came for a month on Bastogne with me. Have no clue. Now this was this was uh, uh, on 547, and you tried not to be behind a tracked vehicle in the dust because you lose your eyes. And this is this is our our unit doing some work to. Uh, Replace a bridge. You could actually. Now around Bastogne, we had the trees blown away, but this close. I mean, they were real close to the road there, 
and uh, we were trying to widen it to th two good lanes for convoys here. And that's what I was talking about, a man sitting on a girder with no weapon. Uh, that was a beautiful waterfall coming down through there. I'm just trying to show the lane. That was the third of the fifth, one of their tanks that would be there for us. Uh, are those Army or Marine? Those were Army. 3rd of the 5th Cav, uh, ninth Division. As we went along, when we could, we would try to knock more trees. It was safety. Uh, that, that's the yeah, show. This, this is Chulai. I spent my last six weeks in Chulai uh, under the, with the 39th Engineers. And I, that time, and I don't know why, I don't... I had to send two squads to Saigon for something for two weeks, and I don't, I don't know why. I go down to July about every every day. You you were in July? Oh yeah, I don't know. Yeah, uh, I I learned I learned to hate sand in July. I was on a fire base in July. I don't even know White sand. which one it was, and you always had sand in your pants, and uh, you know. You didn't have enough scream, uh, skin cream. It was. Uh, Want to kind of wrap it up a little bit. Yeah. Now this this was on QL1, and the reason we're going so slow is the locals are out walking. If the locals are walking, you're not going to get ambushed because they didn't want to. They didn't want to just piss off the town f folks. So as soon as you didn't see anybody on the road. You hit the metal. That's why I'm going to speed up here. We're going to speed up real quick here. <laughs> we didn't see anybody. And uh, just one more minute, Mike, and we'll... We're going to speed up here. Now, in, in, in July, one of our missions was go inland. There were some French... Uh, headquarters and hospitals there and it was the start of Vietnamization and one of our one of my jobs which I really hated is uh, paying rep retribution to civilians that were uh, casualties of firefights and we gave them money and you, you gotta get a bunch of piasters uh, you know 200 bucks you know for uh, for their wounds and we had to compensate them on the road if we had an issue. I think a pig got so many piasters. A chicken got half of what a pig is worth. And if you hit and kill the civilian, they, the family got half of what a chicken was worth. <laughs> I don't know who came up with that. Um, this was this was a scary area because they would ambush us from those trees back there, and it was not a free fire zone because there were families and things. You could only return fire when fired on, and when you're fired on, you know, you've taken in 300 rounds before you can even pull the trigger, you know. And this is uh, this is in way the Imperial City, the, they blew the bridge during Tet. And this is a pontoon bridge that the uh, Seabees put in. And I don't know why I was there. I think we were doing some road work. And you'll see Barney Fife here. Uh, he's a, a civilian cop there. He has sunglasses and he was about 90 pounds. That's me and my field first sergeant. And, like For the life of me, I don't know what we were doing. And Barney will show up here in a minute. <coughs> if you remember, maybe made there he is. Barney, Barney, Barney thought he was pretty important, you know. And uh, uh, Sergeant Caldwell actually threw him in the river, and I don't know why. But <laughs> Caldwell was on his third tour. Uh, this would be a good place to break, and then we can start from the beginning, and then you can just fast forward till we get to Hill 88. Yeah. If, no, 
I'd say. Yeah, if anybody wants to. Finish up when you came back, what you did. Okay. You know, until you got out, and then if people have to leave, you can go ahead. We'll take a break, and we'll just continue showing some of Mike's films there. Again, yeah. Just one thing to highlight. This area was fought over tremendously all throughout the war, and the main reason was the distance from the border here to the ocean was not much more than 30 miles straight line distance. It was the nearest, uh, you know, shortest distance here. And several times uh, during the Vietnam War, the North Vietnamese tried to make a major push to push on here because if you did that, you cut off, you know, about a quarter of the total country, which is what they were looking for the final collapse. And when the country finally did collapse, you know, it resulted from the drives coming down from the north, which were very sharp. You know, and this is the one major road you got going all the way down, com combined with another drive in from, you know, this direction. And once things started collapsing, you know, you have everyone fleeing south, confusion, everything. And it just kind of precipitated on down. And the reason the, the Asheville Valley was so important this is North Vietnam, the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos. Mm -hmm. At this time in 68 and 69, they sent convoys totaling 10,000 vehicles a day, every day, to the south. The B-52s hit them, and you're thinking, how many vehicles did they have if they could dispatch 10,000 a day? And... 7,000 of those never made it back. Yeah. And uh, well, so. It's just easy. The Soviets just replaced everything that. Uh, yeah. You know, they could ship it in the Haiphong, you know, free open ports. In fact, I never realized it either. Up until the, the last, they actually were shipping them in down south into Cambodia. There was a port right down in the south there. Uh, which a lot of Russian equipment came in. So the Ho Chi Minh Trail wasn't all from the north. For down in, you know, free, free core area, a lot of it came straight from Cambodia. And these... We were down by 36% our forces in 71. And that's when you sent me our 71, 72. So with the Vietnamization, turning it over to the Vietnamese, that's how we reduced our forces. Well, I was with the 25th Infantry, and they sent home most of the divisions, but left one brigade. And I stayed with that one brigade and we shifted it down to Swan. But we were only one brigade. 196. We captured three. Russian howitzers with the ammunition. We also captured three trucks that were brand new. And you open the door of the truck, there's a the brass plate, Ford Motor Company, but all the information was in Russian. <laughs> so during the Vietnam War, Ford Motor Company actually had a plant in Russia building trucks that went to Vietnam, coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. <laughs> so when I got back, I, I, I left uh, the 31st of, the, uh, of, uh, of uh, August, which was a sad day. My absolute best friend ever in the Army was killed that day in the Asheville Valley. He was the first sergeant of the 59th Land Clearing Company. And I went to Fort Devens. Massachusetts with the 18th Engineer, uh, Combat Engineer Brigade, and our one of our big missions was going to Boston for riot duty. On any given weekend, there could be 30,000 students protesting the war, and there was a Boston Army base, which was a pier, and there was a big line down the middle of it. Half of the base was uh, Army, and half was civilian shipping. And we were sent there with bayonets and ammunition uh, to uh, protect the uh, base. They were going to push the fence down. And they did some horrible things to us in the middle of the winter. And we went there like three or four times. 
And uh, I'll, I'll end on my battalion commander, Lou Benito at the time, was the CO of the uh, training brigade when I went through OCS. He was another East Coast Italian. And Lou thought he was uh, uh, General Custer. And uh, so we had sea rations and things like this. One time we, we were there like four days. We didn't have enough money of uh, food. And there were five restaurants on the on the uh, uh, the pier, and uh, Lou declared martial law. One of them one of them was a four star one of them was a four star uh, restaurant, and he told me to go tell all the restaurant owners that uh, he declared martial law, and anybody uh, in uniform could order whatever they wanted, and that included wine. And about two months later, uh, me and Lou had to uh, go uh, <coughs> appear before a congressional committee wanting to know why it was some, you know, $390,000 was billed to the, we told him this, I, I sent him, told him to send the bills to the Pentagon. <laughs> and uh, I signed the all for him. <laughs> so everybody ate pretty good, you know, so. So, Final question Mike. yeah, and thank you, thank you very much, and I want I want to thank Mike, Mike, and everybody here for the great job they do. And if you want, um, we're going to get of Hill 88, and I'll tell you the story of Hill 88. Well, Mike, okay, thank you. Thank very you. Much for, uh, and, and here, is, here is one of our museum challenge coins. So thank you. Well, thank you so that. much. And hope you'll help us at the. I will. I will. I. Uh, Look forward to it. I have a lot of free time. <laughs>